Italy, one of the greatest countries on earth. It's achingly, achingly beautiful. It's like a mirage. I'm Alex Polizzi, and my Italian heritage is intrinsic to who I am. Buongiorno. I've got a treasure trove of childhood memories that were made here. Now I'm returning on a voyage of discovery that will take me from top to toe. It gives me shivers to be back. Immersing myself in the culture of its vast regions. <laughs> Reconnecting with my roots. Hi, darling. And uncovering some of this magnificent country's secrets. This has completely blown me away. Wow. Wow. This is one of the glories of Italy, and if you haven't seen it, you really should come. My Italian pilgrimage concludes in the far south, an area of some of the most untouched regions, and for me, unfamiliar territory that's ripe for exploration. I'll be discovering the region of Puglia before spending time within Italy's largest national park. And I'll be taking in the sights of the magical city of Matera. When you travel this far south, there is no shortage of iconic beauty spots. In fact, here, you'll discover some of the cleanest sapphire seas and sandy beaches in the country. But I think the whole character of Italy begins to change, and the region of Puglia, found at the heel of the country's boot, has its own very distinctive identity. With its lush farmland, magical trulli, sparkling whitewashed towns and searing climate, Puglia somehow feels nearer to the wilds of nearby Greece than the nobility of distant Rome. This region's mile upon mile of arid farmland reflects its humble agricultural past, and today it's famous for its produce, which includes exceptionally good wine. Deep in the heart of rural Puglia, you'll find a vineyard with a difference, where the wine is a reminder of the South's most sinister side. It's no secret that Italy has a serious problem with the Mafia, and this corner of the country has felt the force of it more than most. Here, there is a constant invisible threat of organized crime but there are grassroots organizations now fighting it. La mafia comanda con la paura delle persone. Perché è chiaro che se io tolgo il posto di lavoro, la persona ha paura, per cui subisce quelle che sono i soprusi di un mafioso. Siamo stufi di sentirci dire che l'Italia è la mafia. Francesco Gigante is part of an anti-mafia cooperative named Libera Terra Puglia. Both inspiring and courageous, its aim is to bring good from land that has been confiscated from the Mafia. Spiegami a chi apparteneva questo terreno, questa casa? Questo terreno questa... apparteneva ad Antonio Screti, cassiere della Sacra Corona Unita. La Sacra Corona Unita è la Mafia, è la quarta Mafia, la Mafia sì. pugliese. Ha diciamo, saputo prendere, se mi consentite, il meglio o il peggio di tutte le mafie già esistenti. The cooperative organically farms the land here, and they've built up a reputation for award-winning wines, even though there is a terrifying tension over what the Mafia might do next. The biggest problem when they started was that no one would work for them because they were scared. Alle spalle di questo muro ci sono i vigneti, gli stessi terreni che ci vengono bruciati. Nel 2008 i vigneti, 2012 il grano, la settimana scorsa il grano. Però andiamo sempre avanti, vogliamo, dare, vogliamo ridare dignità a questi terreni, perché la dignità qualcuno gliela ha tolta. It's a pretty frightening reality to live with, but in a show of support for the anti-mafia movement, 
People now queue up to work here among the vineyards, like head agronomist Fabio does. Quanto vino fate in, con questi ettari? Quante bottiglie? Riusciamo a produrre intorno ai 60 ettolitri di vino, 4000 bottiglie. Cerchiamo anche di essere un'azienda importante nella qualità del prodotto che facciamo. Questo, certo. Noi vogliamo che il nostro prodotto venga apprezzato per la qualità, non per il lato sociale. Sì. Nevertheless, standing here at the entrance to the chapel, where reputedly the mafia used to initiate new members, it's difficult not to be cowed by the sobering history behind these wines. So che c'è una storia dietro ogni, ogni bottiglia e questo si chiama Alberelli della Santa. È dedicato, come gli altri vini, eh, a delle vittime di mafia. Questo vino è dedicato al sorriso e alla freschezza dei giovani Michele Fazio e Gaetano Marchitelli, ragazzi baresi uccisi innocenti per mano mafiosa. Allora, questo si chiama Renata Fonte. Vai, Renata Fonte, nome e cognome. Renata è il nome, Fonte e cognome. Sì. Assessore repubblicano al comune di Nardò. Sì. È stata uccisa perché è ribellatasi all'abusivismo edilizio in un'oasi protetta che è veramente il posto più bello della Puglia, uno dei posti più belli della Puglia ed è ancora rimasto intatto grazie al suo sacrificio. Uccisa si dice per mano mafiosa da persone che molto vicine a lei sui banchi comunali del comune di Nardò. The names they call these wines honor the memories of victims of the mafia, but they do not bang on about it. Of course, they think it's important to present a front against the mafia, but first of all, they want people to buy their products because they're stupendous. While the war against the ever-present mafia is still being fought, I think this is a beautiful way to pay tribute to its victims and a hint that there's much more than meets the eye to the surprising South. There are parts of the region of Puglia that have a distinctly foreign feel, and to understand why you need to look to its past. The geography of the region made it right for invasion, and for centuries, every major power of the period colonized Puglia. Each country left a lasting legacy on the landscape, from the Turkish to the Greek. But it's the Baroque beauty of the city of Lecce that makes it one of the most celebrated sites of the South. For me, Lecce is the jewel in Puglia's crown. This is called the Florence of the South. Every single building in the historic center is made out of the same local stone. You know, the architecture changes so dramatically between the North and the South. The cities are more decaying and uh, there's a great attrition of time in a way, but they are romantic with a capital R these wonderful Baroque facades that you won't find anywhere else in the world. A city of golden honey hues, Lecce is becoming an increasingly popular part of Italy's tourist trail, as visitors experience its relaxed rhythm and laid-back cafe culture. But for all its grandeur, it's not the only example of pure architectural beauty that can be found in this region. Even the smallest towns can be visually striking, my favorite being the little-known hillside town of Locorotondo. Its labyrinth of lanes have afforded it listed status as one of the most beautiful villages in Italy, and deservedly so. It is perfect. It's like this little jewel. The impression is of very clean beauty. It's the kind of place you dream of living. To come across an unexpected gem like this 
which feels more connected to its southern Mediterranean neighbours than to Italy, is all part of the appeal of Puglia. It's like a lot of little towns in Greece, whitewashed to keep, reflect the sun, to keep the heat away. White was also historically used to repel the plague. I don't know how effective it was, but it's certainly pretty. Perched 400 metres up, the stunning vista out across the arid landscape is a reminder of how precious water is here and a reason for the distinctive pitch roofs of the town. These roofs are called kumerza and they're very particular to this part of the world. There's very little rain here and so every single bit of rainwater has to be harvested so that it can be reused and this design makes sure that it is. An hour or two wandering these peaceful streets allows you to immerse yourself in its culture, one that even now nods to its peasant past. Here, the butcher has always been at the heart of village life, and it's no different today. Inside, you can indulge in the tradition of fornello pronto, a concept that was born out of peasant life. Oh, God, my belly, my poor fat belly. For the butcher, there was money to be made from their otherwise less appealing leftovers each day. Bombette di suino, so that is pork. Okay, so it's a bit of the neck that has had the bone taken out of it. And it's rolled with cheese in the middle. They would grill the meat for the locals in a wood-fired oven and serve it to them straight away in the shop. The village folk would save on charcoal and wood with the added bonus of enjoying an evening out with the neighbours. Mm. Finger licking good. I mean, I can't say I believe it's very dietetic, but my goodness, it's good. Age-old traditions like these were what brought people together in Puglia's towns and villages. But some are more curious than others. Spending time in Puglia, you may discover that the region has its own unique soundtrack. It's not unusual to happen upon a crowd of people dancing maniacally to the frenzied rhythm of tambourines and violins. This is a folk dance known as a pizzica. Fast, frenetic and hypnotic, the pizzica derives from a centuries-old concoction of faith healing and peasant culture. This devilish dance was thought to have been the only way to banish the poison of a tarantula bite. It's almost like an exorcism, a musical catharsis. It can go on for hours. The pizzica music is merely a hint of the rich history and folklore of the region. Head the iconic Trulli district around Locorotondo, and it's likely you'll be met by the atmospheric sights and sounds of its people. Women like Graziella are the real spirit of Puglia. Io qua quasi quasi non capisco una parola. E sono tutti in dialetti. Buona, buongiorno. Buongiorno, buongiorno. buongiorno. Posso entrare? E come no? Grazie. Accomodatevi. Graziella lives in a trullo, a curious beehive-shaped house that you only find here. These fairy tale looking structures have peppered this landscape for the last 5,000 years. Today, most have been converted into shishi B&Bs and holiday homes. 
but Graziella has lived in her true love for most of her life. È venuta a vivere qui da quando è sposata sì, o sì. poco dopo? No, no, mi sono sposata, sono venuta qui, ho vissuto con i miei soci più di 30 anni. Cos? 30 anni eh. of living with our in-laws. Sono morti all'età. Se, se quello non ti insegna pazienza? No, la pazienza la, già ce l'avevo, se no non mi avesse neanche sposato, non avesse accettato <ride> di stare con i suoceri. Sì. E, per, e poi la cucina la sapevi già fare bene bene, la sua, uh, la sua mamma le ha insegnato. A quei tempi se uno non sapeva fare la cucina non ti sposava neanche, non ti volevano gli uomini. <ride> Gosh, well, it's lucky times are different. In a land where cuisine is king, Puglia's cucina povera, peasant cooking, is legendary. Fava beans have fed the poor here for hundreds of years. 500 kilos of these, uh, her and her husband, and she's 80, by the way, uh, took a week to harvest. So as at evening entertainment, when it's raining or when they're sitting by the fire, they sit there and they take off the hard skin. Ma prima si sbucciano no, e poi... No, 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 prima si... Ok, e prima, così. No, no, sì, e poi si boliscono. Poi si boliscono, sì. Poi e si poi mettono al mi... sole e si fanno asciugare bene, bene, bene. Ah, e poi si vengono... vengono so. Deve ricordarsi, signora, che io sono una ragazza di città. Non capisco tutta questa roba. Deve spiegarmi come se fossi idiota. Eh sì, ma Va io, bene? io in dialetto sì, però in italiano è difficile. Ma io non me. parlo il dialetto, scusami. Eh beh, non, siamo due lingue diverse. <ride> Poi questi. Sì. Poi da questi si tolgono subito la buccia. Se den, si boliscono la prima volta. Una, solo una volta si boliscono. Qui. Ok, allora aspetta che spiego per quei altri poveri innocenti come me che non <laughs> capisce il lavoro. These have got to be placed into boiling water for five minutes, the time to say a Catholic credo. And then they are spread out in the sun on the fields to become completely dry, to then have this work done to them, at which point they will be ready to be cooked. So next time you have a bean salad, think of that. Se al mio ritorno ti trovo ammaritata, mi spunterò la spada e la testa ti taglierò. Canina questa. <laughs> a staple dish here is the classic fava bean puree. She is mashing up the fava beans with a bit of potato, boiled potato as well, and some olive oil, and that is it. She's just got the technique. Look at that. The more you beat them, the smoother and the whiter the paste becomes. In the old days, she used to make this every single day, so she must have done it. But they're fresh, they're in the thousand times in her life. She's getting tired, she says. It's not like it used to be. This is a poor people's dish, she says. Uh, this is a dish that you can always eat. This part of my adventure has been unexpected, but the further I head into this remote part of Italy, the more rugged, rustic and surreal it becomes. A world away from the sun-bleached fairy tale landscape of Puglia, the heart of southern Italy is eaten up by the majestic expanse of the country's largest national park, Monte Polino. Here, the sublime scenery is a complete surprise to me. The vast landscape stretches across the regions of Calabria and Basilicata. Its imposing peaks, wooded glens and rushing streams retain an ancient rugged charm still yet to be tainted by mass tourism. It is an undiscovered treasure for many Italians too. The park is peppered with several sleepy villages and small towns, many of them with an intriguing history. This one, the peaceful town of Civita, 
hints at why this part of the country has a distinctly foreign feel. Pepe is a guide to the local area. Good morning. Good morning, how are you? Benvenuta nel Parco Nazionale del Pollino. Grazie. Questo è un paese particolare, è un paese non italiano, è un italo albanese. The Albanians crossed the Adriatic Sea 500 years ago, fleeing the Ottoman Empire. They settled in villages throughout Polino, bringing their culture with them. A quiet stroll around Civita makes for a great start to the day, but its positioning within the park also makes it a gateway to the wilderness beyond. Quante estende molto il parco? Scusami con gli occhi. Il parco sono 200.000 ettari. E... 200.000 tra Basilicata e Calabria, sì. The epic vistas of Monte Pollino are an adventurer's playground. Apparently there's extreme mountain biking here. There's canyoning, there's rafting, and there's free climbing. Or, for the more sedentary amongst us, there is merely marvelling at the view. But if that wasn't appealing enough, you can also discover an abundance of wildlife here, from golden eagles to a few shy wolves and a band of feral mountain goats. Allora, praticamente qui intorno mm. hanno sempre allevato la capra, sì. è un, un animale abbastanza comune. I pastori portano a pascolare questi animali, mm. poteva capitare ogni tanto qualche animale si perdeva. Mm. Quando scappa su questi posti qua eh, non è facile recuperare una capra. Credo che siano ormai circa 50 esemplari che girano, camminano ovunque, anche lì sopra. Dove... Ah, c'è una lì, vedo, vedo. Ce, ce n'è una, una nera, nera e una e bianca. Poi ci sono, ce n'è una bianca, mm. ma sono due bianche, con una piccola, una ma capretta. Tanto... Ma che cavolo fanno lì? Perché lì non ci sono predatori, non c'è, non c'è il lupo, non ci arriva l'uomo. I've got no idea how they get up there, or more importantly, how you'd get down. It's a pretty inhospitable place to live. But for some, the remoteness of the park make it an idyllic place to call home. And for Carpenter Quirino, the abundance of wood all around offers a perfect, if unexpected, way to make a living. Salve, sono Alex Polizzi. Ciao. 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 Lei vive qui da quando, su Monte Pollino, dico? Sono nato qui 50 anni fa, vivo, vivo in questo paese, vivo in questo posto perché mh, sono molto legato alla, alla montagna, alla natura che mi circonda. From the piece of his workshop in the wilderness, using locally sourced wood, Quirino, a musician himself, handcrafts what looks like a complicated cousin of the Scottish bagpipes. This is an instrument traditional. This is called Zampogna a Chiave. Ah, Zampogna a Chiave. These are instruments traditional, like the form of this. Zampogna exists from the center of Italy to Sicilia. How did you learn to make this instrument? It was easy for me costruire questo strumento perché l'ho preso da un vecchio costruttore, un bravissimo mm. costruttore e ho copiato i suoi strumenti, mm. precisamente nelle misure, nelle decorazioni e fin quando è risultato finito lo strumento. Cioè praticamente ho adattato tutta la mia attrezzatura riguardo il tornio a costruire questi strumenti. Sì, mi fai sentire come suona? I really wasn't expecting to find this here.
and such an enchanting sound. Che ti piace di questo suono? Cos'è che ti piace per suonare questa, questi, questo strumento? Ma già dal ritmo che ho fatto significa che è, un, è una suonata per una danza. Yes, it's party music. You can tell from the kind of beat that it's music people dance to, uh, particularly couples. And I must say, I was tapping away with my foot. To me, Italy is like a rich tapestry. Each region another colorful patch on the quilt. Basilicata is no exception. It's one of the least populated, least visited, and least understood regions in the country. One of the smallest, too. But hidden in this remote, arid landscape is one of the most intriguing places I've ever been to. The ancient city of Matera is both haunting and beautiful. I came here on my honeymoon, and I've longed to uncover more of its enchanting secrets ever since. I love Matera. It's one of the first continuously inhabited sites in Europe, and so it's got this immense resonance and history which I find most appealing. It's a very timeless landscape, and it's unusual that you have so little modern that intrudes into your consciousness. I mean, this is one of the glories of Italy, and if you haven't seen it, you really should come. Walking through its atmospheric streets, it's easy to feel like you've stepped back in time. It's almost biblical. Today, it's hard to imagine that not so long ago, Matera was known as the shame of Italy. In the 1950s, families were crammed into its cave houses, living along livestock with no running water or sanitation in abject poverty. The squalor and malaria-ridden conditions became a national scandal. The entire population of 20,000 people were forcefully relocated to new housing projects, leaving it an empty shell a ghost town. Ciao. Francesco has some astonishing memories of Matera. Francesco, what's your connection to this place? It's a very strong connection. All my family was born here. I was born here as well. And uh, ancestors going back to time, century after century, all my family was from here. And so I have a very strong relation to Matera. This area was completely abandoned where I was born after when I was 20 years old. And so I used to come here because it was everything was deserted. It was a big ghost town. And for a kid, for a teenager, it was like a big playground. So I was feeling like a little Indiana Jones with all friends of mine, as everything was uh, for us to know and to explore and to discover. There was nobody around, just us. This is the part of the historic city. This is the newer bit, though, isn't it? This is the newer, new, the newest part of the old town, yes. So, Risale, uh, when, was, when does it, I mean, when was it? It got back to the 1400. 1400. So, 600 years ago, roughly. Gosh, and that, so that's the new bit. And the old bit? <laughs> <laughs> they are the caves, and they are thousands of years old. Yeah. And all the caves that are hidden beyond the buildings, they date back 10,000 years ago, 6,000 years ago. So, in every house, people sleep in the same place of their ancestor of 10,000 years ago, which is quite amazing. Until recently, the caves remained damp, derelict and abandoned. But now Matera has emerged from the dark shadows of its recent past. In the 90s, UNESCO declared it a World Heritage Site. And since then, there has been a complete renaissance in the fortunes of this national treasure. These was my grandparents' home, where my mother was born as well. Now is a hotel room. Gosh, would this have been for one family? Yes, that's correct. And there were just three people, my, my grandparents and my yes. mother. 
Was it in a terrible state when you got your hands on it again? Yes, it was in a very terrible state. I still have the pictures. Everything was black on the, on the ceiling. It was rubbish around the place. It's like you felt like you are in Pompeii. That's that alcove. Yes. And this, this is, is the ceiling. Is the ceiling with now it's painted. It, there was a big fire here. That's yeah. why everything is black in the picture. There was a big fire during the abandoned time. This was taken in uh, 1952. Oh my god. And gosh. you can see all the clothes hanging, people oh and gosh. old women ch chatting, the little car. We the wheelbarrows. Yes, and this is just 20 years later. <gasps> Dolly, yeah, everything that is abandoned. Is unbelievable. Yes, How it was like this till the 90s. It's astonishing. It's a wonderful comparison. It's a now, one of these ladies was my grandmother. And they had to leave. How did your grandparents feel when they had to move out? Well, most people of their generation, they were quite, quite happy to move because we were the shame of Italy, the disgrace of Italy. So they were happy to move to new neighborhoods. They were modern, and so they just abandoned them. It was my generation to understand the value that we were losing, as this was not just the disgrace of Italy. It was an incredible heritage that we were losing. And it's not a coincidence that in their generation, Matera was the shame and the disgrace of Italy. In my generation, is a world heritage. Everything has changed, and now we do understand that what the, the Italy thought it was a shame was just a picture of a very long film. Yes. That which is going on, and has been going on for 10,000 years, and will last for 10,000 years more. Matera may be Europe's most dramatic story of rebirth. Tourists are now flooding back to the city, but this is not a landscape that's been blemished by modern life. Luxury hotels are concealed within its honeycomb of caves. I'm told that nothing can quite prepare you for a visit to Le Grotto della Civita, a luxury hotel with a difference. So tell me a bit how long this hotel has been here and the idea behind it. The idea is to preserve the history, the cultural uh, tradition of the places and the uh, people from this place. This case were abandoned in the 50s and now it's possible to come back and leave this atmosphere, this ancient feeling of the past. It took 10 years to restore these ancient caves into 18 boutique bedrooms. Wow, this is lovely. <sighs> Very beautiful. <gasps> Look at that view as well. It's amazing. <laughs> I mean, it's very rarely that I'm blown away by somewhere, but this is completely blown me away. It's romantic and it's done with just such immaculate, immaculate taste. The lighting, the furniture, the linen and the candles everywhere and, 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 and. It's just really very nice. So let's, shall we? And these caves were just houses, houses yes. for peasants and uh, for poor people. They used to live with animals, with mm. donkeys, and now it's completely different. Of course. We tried to restore these caves in the most authentic way possible. It's lovely to see something that has been restored so lovingly and so carefully, and that is kind of quite true still to certain elements of how things used to be. I've always felt that you should be able to wake up in a hotel and know exactly where you are in the world. But this is something else. 
makes me very dissatisfied with my current living arrangements. It really is amazing. I can't think of a hotel that's captured my imagination more, actually. But Matera is a city of two extremes, as I'm about to discover. Until 25 years ago, the southern Italian city of Matera was a desolate, deserted and dirty secret of Italy. It was called Italy's shame, Matera. Um, and it's lovely to see it blossom into a pride of Italy. Today, its subterranean slums have become a luxury destination unlike any other in the country. And Matera is now fated around the world. But what's less celebrated outside of the city is the annual festival, the centuries-old feast of the Madonna della Bruna. In a workshop in the heart of the city, the finishing touches are being applied to a lovingly handmade float. It forms the centerpiece of the festa. The float is a real work of art, built out of papier-mâché and decorated with ornaments and statues of saints. It takes four months to design, build and decorate at a cost of about 25,000 euros. But for all its glory, this masterpiece always meets an ugly end. In the days leading up to the festa, no one in the city sleeps. Italians love a festa, and this is one of the more impressive ones that I've ever heard about. I've never seen it before. It's all tied up with a historic religious significance, but it's become more than that. It's become a sign of pride, not just in your region, but in your specific town or city. I believe there are going to be 60,000 people here tonight. I asked specifically to be removed from the crowd because, quite honestly, I've never seen more armed police than a rather violent football match. I mean, they're, they're three deep, the police, down there. I don't know what they think is going to happen, but they're obviously prepared for the worst. <laughs> it may be little known outside of Matera, but this festa is a very big deal to the people here. to do a selfie. <laughs> look, now quite a lick is coming. It all looks terribly unsafe. The float makes a ritual journey through central Matera, teasing and dividing the crowds as it passes the twinkling decorations, before returning to the square to meet its ultimate fate. It's the, the tension is definitely building. What can I say? They are putting their helmets on. I think that is a sign that they expect something to happen quite soon. Oh, my God! All the guys are trying to get already preparing to get over the barricade. Oh, my God, it's so exciting. <laughs> Baying crowds have set upon the chariot like wild animals. It's a rite of destruction, a frenzy of religious devotion. Look, they're gathering trophies. They're gathering trophies. Taking home any piece of the float is thought to bring good luck, and the competition is ferocious.
In less than 70 seconds, the wreckage is complete. The float is nothing more than a carcass, a skeleton of its former self. Four months of this artist's work of creating this float, gone in seconds. This festival is a fitting finale to my Italian travels. I consider myself incredibly fortunate to have had the opportunity to step outside of my everyday life and experience the length and breadth of a country that means so much to me. I've burrowed into its great cities, immersed myself in its rich culture mm. and revisited the people and places that are so dear to me. Alex. Hi, darling. And what's become more and more apparent to me is there's something wonderful, something unusual, something unexpected around every corner. There's so much to Italy. There's this huge interior that very few tourists, relatively speaking, still discover, which is a shame because there's so many jewels here. Culinary, architectural, historical. You could keep coming back here for 20 years and always find something new. But more than anything, this trip has allowed me to learn about myself. When I was younger, I always used to think, but as an Italian, I felt rather too loud and too emotional for England. And when I came to Italy, I was considered very British. Now I feel as if I've got the best of both worlds. How lucky I am to have such a rich dual heritage. It's kind of strengthened my ties to Italy again. It's reminded me of why I feel Italian and what I love about it so much here. It's very hard not to love Italy. I always have, but it's nice to be reminded of why.